Good morning. Welcome to RUSI in London. My name is Marina Varotniuk. I'm a research fellow at RUSI. We are recording today's event. It's available in two languages. You can choose the Russian language version by clicking the icon interpretation down your screen. Today's event is part of the UK-Russia security dialogue that Russia has, RUSI has hosted in cooperation with RIAC. Russian International Affairs Council for the last six years. Uh, last December, the participants of the dialogue discussed the implications of the coronavirus pandemic for the international security at the Global Help Workshop. Early this year, Rusi and Ryuk convened a workshop which explored the various issues affecting the contemporary European security architecture. Uh, the UK and Russian participants presented their perspectives on the European security, including the prospects for the arms control. They analyzed the security complex in the Baltic Sea and Northern Europe. The main discussion points have been published in a conference report. And today the aim is to showcase the findings of this report to discuss the insights from the workshop and also to analyze the wider bilateral agenda. The text of the report, as well as the previous policy brief on the global health and security can be found on the website. Importantly, today in the morning, RUSI hosted another event where Russian and UK young researchers, MA and PhD level students discussed the role of European uh, multilateral security framework, NATO, OEC, EU, and RUSI considers it important to incorporate young researchers component to the project to provide a space for engagement with early year researchers from the UK and Russia. Uh, we believe that this next generation dimension is important because it uh, allows to identify the future trajectories of thinking about the field, the European security, and approaches that are likely to inform the decision making in the coming years. And uh, similar to the previous event, uh, today the young researchers identified the current security problems that European continent faces and discussed uh, uh, um, often conflicting threat perceptions which demonstrate the complexity of the relationship. They of course acknowledge that Russia-UK relations have become increasingly strained in the last decade uh, they sign, uh, cited some impediments to full-scale normalization between Russia and the West, and they offered some solutions and which pragmatic areas of cooperation they see. This was a frank exchange on where in which system of co coordinates they, the next generation of uh, decision makers and influencers, academics, find UK-Russia relations what is the way for stabilizing the situation and mitigating the security risks of this uh, continued confrontation. Having introduced uh, the previous workshops, let me turn now to our today's event and uh, let me uh, turn to the speakers and introduce the speakers now. I would like to introduce the experts who led and actively contributed to this security dialogue. Uh, let me introduce Professor Malcolm Chalmers, who is uh, Deputy Director General at RUSI. Professor Andrei Kortunov, who is a Director General of RIAC. Uh, Dr. Neil Melvin, uh, who is Director of International Security Studies Research Group at RUSI. And Dr. Sergei Utkin, who is the Head of Strategic Assessment Section at Primakov Institute of uh, World Economy and International Relations, MMO. And let me address the audience now. Let me invite uh, the ones who are following us live now to contribute to this discussion. You have a chance to raise your questions. You can type your questions in the Q&A box. So we will attempt to collect them to answer your questions in the Q&A session after the speaker's introductory remarks. And now let me give the floor to uh, Professor Malcolm Chalmers. Marina, thank you so much uh, for that uh, great introduction. You've uh, set the ball rolling uh, incredibly well. Uh, and I just want to make a few introductory remarks to, uh, to uh, get some things to, to talk about in, in this discussion. I think I found this, this year's dialogue 
unusual though it has been because of its virtual format. Uh, very interesting as always. And uh, I'd like to give my thanks to all those who've made it possible in Russia as well as in the UK. If there was one theme I think that shone through uh, our discussions this year was that I think on both sides, we agreed that the state of relations uh, between the UK and Russia is in a sort of low level semi-equilibrium. It's a relationship that's not acceptable and certainly not desirable, but it feels bearable in the sense that it could go on for a long time. Indeed, it feels as if the relationship today isn't that different from where it's been for the last five or six years, certainly after the the annexation of, of Crimea in 2014 and everything that, that followed that. And I was struck uh, looking at the UK's integrated review, of course, in the last couple of weeks, we've had a major review of UK foreign security policy in general coming out and then followed a week later by uh, a, a defence command paper uh, linked to that. And one of the things that struck me in both those papers from a UK point of view was that was how little has changed over the last couple of years in how the UK sees its relationship with Russia. Uh, Russia continues to be seen as an acute security challenge uh, and that hasn't changed I think and, and all the, the concerns the UK has had particularly since the since the attempted assassination of, of Skripal in, in Salisbury, but, but certainly going before that. Uh, there hasn't been a, bit, a lot of new thinking, uh, new initiatives in relation to Russia. The, the area, of course, there has been innovation in those reviews, particularly in relation to China, and noticeably a more assertive position in relation to China, more focus on technology as a driver of policy, quite a lot more uh, emphasis and indeed some extra money on military modernization, both of UK conventional and nuclear forces. And I think the nuclear modernization is especially interesting in part because it, it was a surprise when it, it was announced a couple of weeks ago. But on, on Russia, on diplomacy towards Russia, uh, there was a, uh, while in relation to China, I think there was still a sense that there was a lot to play for in terms of whether or not that relationship would, would worsen. It felt in relation to Russia, as I think we discussed in our workshops, uh, less potential for reset. And indeed recent efforts uh, by France and by the European Union, each in their own way, to see whether there is space for a reset in relations between Europe and the Russian Federation which most in the UK policy establishment looked at rather skeptically. I think the failure of those efforts uh, by the European Commission and by the French president, uh, I think makes it even less likely that uh, the UK government will see much uh, to be gained from taking its own initiatives or indeed uh, joint initiatives with, with some of its allies. Uh, and uh, maybe a, a linked part of that uh, diagnosis of low level unacceptable but bearable equilibrium is in relation to formal arms control. I mean, having been involved in this sort of discussion for quite a number of years, this waxes and wanes and we go through periods, we went through a period a decade ago in the last major effort uh, at reset by the United States with uh, President Medvedev. Um, there, there are periods where formal arms control uh, is one of the main areas in which uh, progress is made and, and was made. And certainly uh, the fact that the new Biden administration, United States, uh, was willing to go forward uh, with, uh, with Russia uh, to uh, renew the New START Treaty for the maximum period uh, possible, it seemed to augur uh, perhaps more prospects in relation to arms control, but very differently from a decade ago, unlike that time, when I think there was a real discussion about follow on to New START and deepening uh, formal arms control in relation to nuclear weapons in particular, 
it doesn't feel right now that there's uh, that same prospect, uh, the new start ratification, very welcome, I think, but nevertheless, uh, still feels rather isolated from, from a broader, broader process of, of arms control. And one of the issues which I think was particularly strongly felt on the UK side in our discussions was in relation to the Chemical Weapons Convention because of the use of those weapons on our own soil, which uh, still resonates in most of the discussions uh, we have in the UK about Russia for good or for ill, but also, of course, a large scale use of chemical weapons uh, by Syrian forces uh, against, uh, against their own population. Uh, a real example of weapons of mass destruction being used on a significant scale. So that really resonates in arms control. If we have arms control in relation to chemical weapons, but it doesn't seem to make a difference to countries which are signatures to that treaty then, what that undermines the, uh, I think, the efficacy of arms control. So, so that's really where we are. But I think one of the, I think one of the points that also came through in the dialogue was that although we are in a state of low level equilibrium, which could go on for a long time, that didn't mean in any way that people felt there are no risks in the relationship. There are some really significant risks, uh, and uh, partly because of the lack of communication, but partly because uh, the geopolitical situation is in flux. New crises arise in new places with new expectations and very fuzzy red lines and concerns uh, and mutual misunderstanding may lead to escalation in crisis or even operational mistakes by low level operators may may create real problems. And I think we, we particularly focused in this year on concerns over Northern Europe. Uh, and in particular, I think about the Baltic subregion, but, but Northern Europe more widely. And for the UK, post Brexit, the importance of our relationships with our friends and allies in Northern Europe are growing both with our NATO allies, uh, Norway and Denmark, but also uh, and the Baltic states, uh, but, but also with uh, Sweden uh, and Finland, traditionally uh, strong friends of the UK. And I think the UK debate on Northern Europe is significantly influenced uh, by what we hear from our friends and allies in Northern Europe. And uh, particularly striking, I think, the way in which countries uh, like Sweden and Finland uh, putting a lot of emphasis on building up uh, their uh, military capabilities after a long period in which they, uh, they were cut uh, quite sharply uh, and directly in, in reaction to growing concern about where Russia may be going next. And then also, I think, uh, uh, our own national security discussion in our integrated review, although nothing changed, I think, diplomatically in relation to Russia or at that broader political level, very clearly, some of the key military uh, decisions, decisions on military capability, uh, were uh, a reaction to concerns about uh, uh, developments in Russia. And I'd focus in particular on the nuclear and uh, maritime dimensions. So the increased investment in, in our nuclear uh, capability and uh, the priority given to the Royal Navy uh, were both, I think, in large measure, a result of concerns about European security. And one of the striking things about our review is despite quite a loud uh, discussion in the UK, quite a lot of uh, political pressure in the UK in relation to the UK playing a much more prominent role in the in the Asia Pacific region, the Indo-Pacific region, as we now call it, the tilt to the Indo-Pacific by the UK has actually been relatively modest and primarily diplomatic and economic in nature rather than military. It's certainly not a pivot by any means. Uh, the, as the government emphasised, the Defence Secretary emphasised, we the, the UK's uh, defence uh, commitments uh, are, first of all, uh, to its NATO commitments are, are equal to that, I think, the commitment to the nuclear deterrent. So maybe maybe one final remark, if I may. I mean, I think we, and I'd be interested to have some remarks on this in this discussion. One of the things, of course, 
uh, we're all looking at now in, in, in recent weeks is how the new US administration is handling issues of international security and how some of the positions they're taking uh, may be deepening some of the security dilemmas which uh, we face in Europe and elsewhere. And I think from a UK point of view, uh, that positive aspect about the new Biden administration is clearly the much greater level uh, of priority it gives to relationships with its allies, and including its European allies. And I think the dialing down the reduction of emphasis on burden sharing as the only thing that matters, which, which we saw in the Trump administration. There's more of a concern, I think, about wh where the more assertive policy of the United States and various different uh, theatres uh, goes next. And uh, I think we are probably none the wiser than anybody else where that's uh, going to go. What does that mean? Uh, uh, the big questions, I think, about Afghanistan, uh, uh, where that will go and what that will mean. Big questions about the JCPOA, which is rather surprising that the Americans have not taken that further forward by, by this stage in the way which people are anticipating. And I think really some really important questions in relation to Taiwan and, and other crises. So uh, it's, it's a lot to play for. Uh, we're all inevitably uh, dependent to some extent on, on American decisions in, in a number of different areas. But I think what, what comes out strongly in the UK policy document is that uh, while the alliance with the United States is, is very important, the US, the UK is, all, is a middle power, which also sees its relationships with, with other middle powers in Europe and more broadly as critical to its own security. Thank you very much, Marina. Thank you very much for your introductory remarks. And let me remind our audience again that you can contribute to this discussion. Please raise your questions, type your questions in the Q&A box, and we will try to reply in the Q&A session. And now I give the floor to Professor Andrei Kortunov. Um, thank you, Marina. First of all, I am very glad to see that uh, we have uh, more than 80 participants uh, online. Uh, have enjoyed uh, our event. I think it's a good sign, suggesting that uh, the topic is interesting uh, and uh, uh, it's still something from uh, which uh, uh, experts uh, and observers expect, uh, uh, hopefully, some uh, pleasant surprises. Uh, let me also uh, express my uh, uh, gratitude uh, to Rusi, uh, to their team, uh, for the multi-year commitment and dedication and patience. Uh, I think uh, it's clearly remarkable. Uh, as a Russian, I might be somewhat uh, too critical of my own country, but I think that uh, Russia has uh, almost a limitless uh, capacity to disappoint and frustrate its partners. Uh, and this capacity has been demonstrated over last year uh, as well. Uh, if uh, we're all back in time uh, and uh, if we put ourselves uh, into March of 2020, uh, when the pandemic uh, started hitting uh, our continent, uh, at that point, uh, I was uh, cautiously optimistic about the relationship between uh, Russia and uh, Europe and Russia and the United Kingdom in particular. I thought that this pandemic, given the scale of the challenge, might somewhat uh, overshadow uh, problems and uh, disagreements that we have uh, between the East and the West of our common common uh, continent. So I hoped that uh, the relationship uh, could get somewhat a little bit better although uh, I had no illusions about our ability to resolve some of the fundamental disagreements between the two sides. Uh, however, as uh, Malcolm has already referred to, uh, most of attempts to change the momentum of the relationship turned out to be unsuccessful. Uh, President Macron uh, tried to reach out to Moscow. Uh, later on, uh, we witnessed uh, an unfortunate uh, trip of uh, Joseph Barrel to Moscow. Again, you know, I don't want to get into details, uh, but uh, definitely uh, uh, today the relationship uh, is not uh, 
uh, much better than it was uh, a year ago. I think that the good news, if you look uh, at the situation from Moscow, is that uh, clear uh, there is no appetite uh, on the Russian side to escalate. Uh, but uh, there is uh, no appetite uh, to make any significant uh, uh, initiatives uh, or uh, unilateral concessions uh, to the West either. Uh, so we can see a stalemate, uh, a stalemate uh, which is likely to last for some time. The situation is not ideal. Uh, the situation uh, is deplorable, uh, but uh, the situation uh, is acceptable or at least affordable uh, on both sides. Uh, if you uh, follow the report that has just been released, uh, uh, you can uh, find there many references uh, to 2014 uh, as the turning point uh, in this relationship. Uh, and of course, uh, unfortunate events that uh, happened uh, in this year uh, marked uh, a watershed uh, in the relationship between Russia and the West and uh, draw a line between Russia and uh, its uh, Western partners. However, in my view, uh, the Ukrainian crisis uh, uh, was uh, arguably the most uh, graphic manifestation of the problems of the relationship, but was not the root cause of the problems. Because uh, even if we were able to overcome uh, this crisis, uh, if uh, a miracle happens and uh, uh, the Ukrainian portfolio is off the table, I don't know how it can be done, but if we imagine that uh, it is done, I don't think that uh, the relationship uh, would get much better, at least uh, in the uh, immediate future, because the problem that I see it uh, uh, is not uh, about disagreements on specific issues, uh, uh, including arms control or European security. I think the fundamental problem is that uh, uh, there are very serious disagreements uh, in perceptions uh, of the world uh, of the international system, of what is fair and what is not in the international relations, what is legitimate and what is not legitimate, uh, uh, and how uh, uh, the preferred uh, world order should look like. Uh, and uh, these uh, disagreements uh, uh, do not necessarily reflect uh, uh, gaps uh, between the two societies. Uh, I tend to believe that uh, uh, there are no major uh, gaps in uh, perceptions at the level of societies, but they definitely uh, indicate uh, very serious gaps at the level of political establishments, at the level of quote unquote uh, uh, political elites. Uh, and uh, this is something that is not likely to change. So I think that uh, the outcome of the uh, confrontation between Russia and uh, the West will not be defined by tactical or even strategic defeats or victories of uh, uh, either side. Uh, it will uh, really uh, be defined by the future of the international system, uh, how the world will evolve and uh, who will turn out to be right. Whether it is going to be uh, Mr. Putin uh, with his vision of the world uh, or uh, his Western opponents uh, like uh, uh, President Biden of the United States uh, uh, or Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Uh, so that uh, uh, situation, of course, uh, limited uh, uh, opportunities uh, to look uh, for uh, some uh, uh, positive uh, changes in the relationship. Uh, and uh, if you go through our report, you'll find that uh, uh, there are no major revelations there. We are not looking for a breakthrough for something that uh, could change the relationship overnight. Uh, however, uh, I think that uh, everybody engaged uh, in this exercise uh, has been uh, opinionated in certain ways. Uh, we've been looking for uh, even modest opportunities uh, and for ways how we could avoid further deterioration of the relationship between Russia and uh, Europe, between Russia and the United Kingdom. I'm not going to retell the content uh, of the document uh, that you all have, 
Uh, but let me just limit myself uh, to saying that uh, we tried to focus on uh, three areas. Uh, the first one was uh, the bilateral Russia-UK relationship uh, and what can be done uh, in terms of uh, reducing the uh, costs and limiting the risks uh, of the bilateral confrontation between uh, Russia and the United Kingdom, whether we are in a position uh, to secure some uh, limited but not insignificant uh, uh, pockets of uh, cooperation which do exist and hopefully which will continue to exist uh, uh, and uh, whether Russia and the United Kingdom can restore some of the communication lines uh, which uh, might uh, be important uh, for providing more security and stability in this bilateral relationship. Uh, the second uh, area which uh, we focused on uh, is uh, 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 conventional arms control in Europe uh, and uh, also confidence building measures in Europe. Uh, we understand that uh, the overall situation is not conducive to think about uh, new ambitious uh, initiatives in this regard. However, uh, there are some uh, small, small incremental steps in our view uh, that uh, are not beyond our reach and uh, that uh, might help us to stabilize uh, the relationship. Uh, we discussed uh, various institutional options uh, like the future of the uh, NATO-Russia Council, uh, like the future role of OSCE and the Council of Europe. Uh, uh, we spent some time talking about uh, the, uh, the Open Skies Treaty, about uh, the Vienna document. Uh, again, I don't want to go into details, but uh, provided that there is political will, uh, some uh, of these uh, opportunities remain open. Uh, and finally, uh, we uh, tried uh, to explore some of the sub-regional dimensions uh, of our security relationship, uh, specifically uh, what is going on uh, in the Baltic Sea area uh, and in the north. Uh, again, uh, these are very controversial issues. Uh, unfortunately, the situation there uh, is uh, is not ideal, and uh, uh, I think it is becoming increasingly difficult uh, to keep uh, the Arctic uh, uh, region uh, away from the geopolitical uh, uh, competition between Russia and NATO. Uh, however, uh, I think that we should not consider it uh, uh, to be a lost uh, case, uh, and indeed, uh, uh, Russia is going to chair the Arctic Council. Uh, starting uh, next month. Uh, I do hope that uh, that might uh, present one of uh, not so numerous opportunities for uh, more interaction between Moscow and London. Uh, I don't want to take uh, too much of your time. Uh, I think that uh, we, uh, uh, we have many issues to discuss uh, uh, today uh, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Andre. And now uh, I would like to invite Dr. Neil Melvin. The floor is yours. Thank you, Marina. It's a pleasure to be, to be with you today. Um, I, mean, I think Malcolm and Andre have covered very comprehensively the, the, what, was, what was discussed in our dialogue meetings and also uh, in the report on European security that is being released today, for which they're the joint authors. So perhaps I could just take in my five or six minutes a moment to reflect on uh, what I think is uh, some evolution in the UK's international security position, which, which has been signaled in the integrated review and uh, the subsequent supporting documents, which I think may play into the future of the UK-Russia relationship. So first of all, I think we, what, what we see with the integrated review is a shift in tone by the UK. In the UK for the last 10 or 15 years, I think has had an essentially defensive international position uh, around the established uh, uh, order. But what we see in the integrated review is a shift to an interpretation of the way that the world is going, which is, I think, much closer to what Russia has been advocating for the last 15 years, which is the UK has now, I think, accepted that the world is becoming more competitive, uh, more threatening, more hostile with state actors, of course, and, and Russia is identified in in that report uh, as one of those. And the UK is positioning itself to be more competitive in that environment. Now, of course, 
I mean, Russia's actions have been one of the factors that have created that new world, but I think the UK now is, is starting to uh, develop its, its strategy around that, uh, that new understanding of international order. I think this sort of reinforces Andre's point about you know, the, the future relationship will be defined in this wider context. So th this brings with it threats, and so very clearly the UK has signaled now that it's going to uh, strengthen its deterrence uh, through military modernization, and as Malcolm spoke about, a, a, a slight shift on the nuclear strategy. Uh, cyber, of course, so that there is an active discussion in, in the UK about the UK as a cyber power and whether there may be uh, some more focus on offensive cyber, so that's going to be another area that needs to be managed. Uh, on the other hand, I think the UK does now see itself as uh, looking to, to take a leading role internationally in some areas, for example, on the discussion about the new pandemic treaty, about climate change. And so there may also be opportunities to work with Russia on those wider issues. In fact, the UK will need Russia to be part of those discussions and even on uh, delicate issues such as we've recently seen uh, in the UN around Myanmar, uh, where the UK led on the resolution there, nonetheless Russia and also China joined that resolution. So that, I mean, that there is, there is an ability to cooperate on even those difficult issues. Secondly, I think that Brexit, we can't ignore Brexit and the implications that it's going to have on, on European security. So now we have Europe's three biggest military actors outside the European Union in the form of Russia, Turkey, and now the UK. So, I mean, there is, there are going to be shifts and there are already shifts underway. The, the two established pillars of European security, uh, NATO and the EU, of course, are now being supplemented by uh, new ad hoc formats, E3, the European Intervention Initiative. And the UK, I think, is, is also uh, looking to play a slightly different role. As Malcolm said, I mean, the Integrated Review clearly asserted that, that Britain was committed to, uh, to the Euro-Atlantic space, uh, and that remains the core of European security. But as an actor now outside the European Union, the UK is looking for, uh, I think, a sort of a, almost like a third role as a, a nucleus for ad hoc security groupings. And I think this is, a, as, as we've seen on, on the northern dimension, uh, where you have uh, non-NATO countries there and non-EU countries, UK as a sort of uh, as this third force around things such as the, uh, the the Jeff, it's an opportunity to try to consolidate and strengthen deterrence. And so I think we're going to see more of that. And indeed, on the integrated review, we do see in the UK a, a kind of a, a much stronger fo focus on the two flanks: the northern flank uh, and the southern flank, being the Mediterranean. And so again, looking at around the, the NATO, non-NATO, non-EU kind of coalitions that the UK may be putting together in those two areas. Uh, thirdly, I think uh, this does bring in, uh, the UK has very clearly signaled that Ukraine remains a core uh, to European security concern to it. Uh, and it's very good that we see today at the last minute that, that there's been consensus in the OSCE on renewing the, the monitoring mechanism on the conflict there. But nonetheless, uh, this does remain a difficult issue and one where there are, are concerns about whether this may be unfolding. I think we touched in this issue in our wider discussion is that the OSCE arms control formats are very important, but also it, it's, a, it's, it's work on conflict prevention, conflict management is being, has been undermined in recent years. And we do need to have uh, a renewal on that. We've seen that with the Karabakh conflict just last year, concern that the Ukraine conflict may be heating up uh, at the moment, uh, and we need to kind of keep an eye on that to make sure that things don't escalate there. And uh, two final points, I think, sort of, that touch upon the, the evolution of, of the relationship. The integrated review, as Malcolm said, uh, it signaled uh, a tilt to some degree away from European security. I mean, the focus was on the Indo-Pacific, but I think actually the if you look at what the UK is doing, it's looking more at the area which is on the, the sort of between the Indo-Pacific and European security, where what we see is a, a zone where the rules of European security don't apply, but we are getting violent instabilities in which state actors are playing key roles. So the UK, I think, is going to become more involved in those issues in the Middle East, 
and Africa through uh, different kinds of security assistance. So that there's going to be this, uh, these new ranger forces working with, uh, with partners on stabilization. Now, part of that, of course, is a concern about Russia's expanding role in those areas. So they'll need to be, I think, as part of our bilateral discussion, uh, also a, a way to manage those new interactions in around places, say, in North Africa, the East Mediterranean, uh, and extending perhaps even into the Black Sea. And the final point, I think, is what the Integrated Review has also signaled is that the UK uh, has been a strong defender of the rules-based order. It's now looking to move beyond that position. It's not abandoning the rules-based order in any way, but it is looking at establishing and negotiating new rules uh, and taking on, I think, a stronger role around uh, this emerging competition. So uh, that may be an Indo-Pacific discussion. It's going to be a wider discussion as well. I think this, uh, with Russia as a P5 power, beginning to actually negotiate uh, and decide what those new rules are, as Andre, I think, was also speaking about, is going to be something that the UK, as part of its, its wider global agenda, will be looking to interact with Russia on, on those issues. And, and I say that begins, brings with it opportunities, but also some areas of risks. So with that, I'll hand back to Marina. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Neil. And uh, let me say to the audience if that you still have time to pose the questions, please uh, do that. And uh, now I uh, will invite uh, uh, Dr. Sergei Utkin for his uh, remarks. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marina. A lot has been said already, but uh, I will try to add a few points uh, that uh, I consider very important uh, when we uh, tackle this uh, UK-Russia relationship and uh, its um, uh, consequences. Uh, of course, we do have negative dynamic, uh, as uh, it uh, has been noted, but um, uh, this is uh, probably not a very new thing uh, for uh, the UK and Russia, unfortunately. Uh, what is uh, to an extent new and uh, what is uh, um, uh, to me uh, worrying is uh, the increasing securitization of uh, uh, the whole relationship. Uh, so you have uh, uh, security issues more and more central. Um, I think uh, the debates around the um, integrated review that uh, the UK just presented uh, also contributed to that. And issues uh, that uh, could potentially uh, serve as a um, uh, field for uh, dialogue and interaction in other areas, uh, they are either sidelined or um, they even stumble at those security issues uh, so that people start thinking that they probably cannot um, proceed as they did uh, with the um, relationships they developed with uh, the Russian actors, UK actors, be it uh, in the NGO field or in the business, um, because of uh, uh, those harsh political and security disagreements. So this is one of the risks I think we have to keep in mind, and um, um, there is still a room uh, for uh, some activities that could um, uh, stop this process from developing. We will not resolve all the issues uh, that um, uh, exist between the countries and uh, between uh, Russia and the West in broader terms. Um, we will not uh, resolve them neither overnight nor in a number of years, uh, but uh, we can keep some areas, some uh, niche subjects that could still serve as um, uh, the uh, fields for dialogue and cooperation uh, possibly. Um, even uh, if a uh, limited one. So this is, I think, one of the tasks that uh, we should be uh, focusing on. Uh, the other task, which is uh, often in all the experts' debates, and I think in this um, uh, dialogue uh, organized by the RUSI and RIAC, uh, we also saw that, um, is um, what one can call damage control. So you do have uh, a tense relationship, you uh, do have issues that will not get resolved, but you also have both sides are genuinely interested in uh, not uh, um, really ruining the whole thing, uh, not ruining the world system, not ruining this also bilateral relationship. I think 
Uh, there is still, in spite of all the issues, uh, interest on both sides to uh, keeping this uh, bilateral relationship as functional. So um, to control the possible damage from the tensions is uh, what we also need to focus on. Um, Borrell's visit to Moscow, Josep Borrell's visit to Moscow was uh, mentioned uh, already, the visit by the uh, high uh, representative of the EU for foreign affairs. And uh, I think one of uh, the remarkable um, aspects of this visit, uh, although Borrell did not represent the UK already, of course, uh, given the Brexit, um, but one of the remarkable um, aspects of this um, visit was that uh, Borrell tried to focus on issues that could potentially bring Russia and the EU together, like Middle East, Afghanistan, JCPOA, and the audience, also the political circles in the EU, were barely interested in those subjects that could potentially uh, create some added value uh, through cooperation of both sides. And I think this is the effect that we very often see in the dialogue uh, between Russia and Western countries, uh, that we do stumble at the issues that divide us, and we are unable to go any step further. We are unable uh, to get to the issues that could potentially serve as uh, a ground for uh, dialogue. This is probably one of the lessons um, also to keep in mind uh, for London and Moscow uh, to be able uh, to, while disagreeing on many things, uh, to be able to tackle those that uh, could potentially uh, be um, interesting for both sides, uh, like Afghanistan, like the JCPOA, like the situation in the Middle East and others. Um, there is this um, uh, famous quote from um, uh, the uh, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, uh, Harold Macmillan, uh, that uh, the biggest challenge that he faced in uh, his uh, um, years in office uh, um, were events. Uh, so the, the, the events were driving his um, uh, political agenda. And uh, indeed, I think this is also true for this uh, bilateral relationship. And uh, of course, there, are, there, there, there can be all sorts of events, including those we cannot predict. But uh, uh, the one development that I consider as probably the most risky and the one that we have to keep in mind all the time and uh, try to tackle it very carefully is the situation in Ukraine. As uh, it uh, has already been mentioned, uh, there are still uh, very high risks in this area. And I just hope that reasonable voices, uh, be it uh, in Kiev and Moscow and other capitals, uh, that uh, uh, indeed uh, think that stabilization of this uh, um, conflictual relationship uh, around Ukraine and between Ukraine and Russia uh, would uh, rather serve the interests uh, of uh, everybody and uh, that escalation would be uh, very um, bad for everyone, uh, that uh, uh, these reasonable voices will have the upper hand. Uh, I think this uh, must be one of the tasks of uh, our, uh, our dialogue, uh, including on the bilateral level. Um, and um, all in all, I think one of the bottom lines that you see in this uh, report about the Rusi React dialogue, and uh, what has to also serve as um, uh, one of the guiding lines, uh, is that um, in spite of um, all the issues that we have, what we need to restore is um, uh, military to military communication, communication on the basis of uh, NATO, uh, the NATO Russia Council. These are the mechanisms that are still available and they shouldn't be seen as uh, gifts that you provide to Russia by just uh, starting this kind of dialogue. This is very often what you hear in Western debates that if you start talking to Russia in um, um, uh, those uh, levels, like military to military or the NATO Russia Council, uh, you uh, would um, uh, give a gift to the regime you want. You, you don't want to give give gifts to, um, and I think this is a wrong approach to those things. Uh, exactly because we want to reduce the damage, we, we want to reduce the risks. Uh, we need those platforms, and we need to use them not just for issues that we stumble at, but also for issues that we could uh, discuss in a more constructive manner. Um, and uh, the, the, the last point, uh, uh, we do see that um, 
Uh, there is a lot of uh, talk in the West about China these days, uh, also for the UK and for every um, Western country in particular. This is a very important subject. Um, also for the uh, integrated review that uh, the UK prepared, I think, uh, of course, everybody uh, picks the subjects that are closest to themselves. And that's why you had uh, uh, the document uh, commented in Russia, mostly with regard to Russia being mentioned as a threat. Uh, but um, uh, all in all, I think it's uh, not like a Russia-focused document. And indeed, you have uh, China as a bigger issue in the Western security debate these days. So one thing that we need to understand and we need to realize that it's probably for a longer time than just the next few years is that indeed uh, this uh, China challenge is seen as very important uh, by the West. But for Russia, uh, it uh, would be just uh, a very bad political option to join any anti-China camp. So it's not just a function of uh, Putin's policies. It's not just a function of uh, uh, current political trends in Russia. It's a, it's a, it's a bigger strategic um, challenge that Russia has to tackle very carefully and has to avoid um, being positioned in some way against China which means uh, that the issues that arise with regard to Russia-China cooperation, with regard to uh, these um, tensions between uh, the West and China, uh, they are long-term and they have to be tackled and one cannot outseat those tensions waiting until uh, the situation um, um, uh, changes uh, uh, to the better, be it in uh, Russian politics or in terms of Western attitudes to uh, the China challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergey, and thank you uh, for, to the speakers. Now we can open the Q&A session. And we've received several questions already. There are some issues of particular interest to our audience. And let me, let me collect the questions. Uh, for example, uh, the question of particular interest is the arms control dialogue. And the question is what potential is there, if any, for productive multilateral arms control dialogue? Uh, in uh, between the UK and Russia. Has this change given the UK nuclear stockpile increase in the integrated review? And probably the one more question uh, is, uh, let's say, uh, are you optimistic that we still have the necessary provisions in place to evade a new devastating conflagration in the world? Yeah, please. Let, let me let me ask Professor Malcolm Chalmers to. Okay, Marina, very very happy to to answer those those questions. I think the the first question also referred to the P five dialogue, which the UK uh, has always been very supportive of, and indeed was instrumental in establishing uh, between the five recognised nuclear weapon states, and the, the UK continues to be committed to that. I don't think the the increase in the ceiling on the UK stockpile uh, makes a difference to that because that dialogue has never been focused on numerical limits on the five powers simply because uh, the US and Russia have so many more warheads than any of the, the three other powers in, including China and nor do I think uh, a policy which which limited the increase in the UK, France and China, uh, while the US and Russia had 10 times the number of warheads would be acceptable to the small powers. But I think there's a lot that, I mean, I, in a way what the UK increase has illustrated is that in a period of continuing technological change in offensive and defensive systems, it just got too hard for this British government at least to to continue to have a commitment to have a, an arsenal which was much smaller in terms of operational deployments than any other nuclear weapon state. And uh, you'll see from the media commentary, quite a bit of that was driven by their perception of, of changes in, in Russian capabilities. So, but absolutely we, we, we should keep up that effort and find ways of having confidence building measures because we are moving to a more multipolar nuclear world from one which was dominated simply by the two nuclear superpowers. And China, of course, is a really important part of that. Uh, but the UK and France also play a role. 
and I think can play a useful role in facilitating that dialogue between the, the five. China will have to be brought in in some way uh, and uh, increasing recognition of that. I don't think we need to wait for the Chinese to catch up with the Russians and the Americans and the size of their arsenal before we have that discussion. On the, the wider question, uh, it, it was, it's was it been a historic uh, achievement uh, of humanity that we've avoided a major world war since 1945. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's part of, I think, the educational process is for us all to, to remind ourselves how devastating that conflict was, especially for the continent in which both our countries lived. Um, but is it possible there could be another confrontation of that sort? Uh, I hope not. I think it's still very unlikely, but you look at some of the saber rattling over Taiwan and you do worry, uh, things can escalate, nuclear weapons. I think one of the things about the, the saber rattling over Taiwan is sometimes is how little nuclear weapons seem to be mentioned as if there could be a major war between the US and China, which would go on for a couple of months and then it would all be over. Uh, and we don't live in that sort of world any longer. And we've had wars in the past, which we thought would all be over within a couple of months and, and prove that they would not be so. So I am worried and I'm especially worried, I think right now about US-China relations because I don't think we found a new equilibrium there and we may not for some time. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it seems that uh, several people in our audience are very interested to bring the US into this equation in the European security. And the question is, what would you anticipate the Biden administration to do with the burden sharing problem in NATO and to make it the question wider also? Uh, uh, is uh, what will be the UK position? Will its uh, positions regarding Russia as well aligned with the with uh, let's say European partners and Washington? And probably the question also to Sergey and Andre also about the future perspectives as you see it. What is the dynamics and what can we talk and mention in this regards about uh, what what kind of uh, relationship? Do you envision that will unfold in the future with the new administration in the US and how it's seen in Moscow? Thank you. Yeah, please. Uh, probably Neil could start with a question on the on the uh, on the US uh, bringing the US in the equation and uh, US factor in. Uh, NATO and also US-UK relationship. Thanks, Bryn. I'll try and be brief. I mean, uh, obviously, we're at a moment when, when there's a, a strong push now to revitalize the transatlantic relationship. I mean, it, it seems to me that this is primarily around the issue of deterrence. Uh, so it's, it's, making, it's making NATO uh, a more effective organization. Uh, and I think th th this goes to the heart of what, one of the difficulties we have, which is, I, I mean, I, I agree with Sergey and Andre about, about the need for dialogue and, and to find areas to cooperate. I mean, that's clearly very important, but it does seem it's been quite difficult to build reciprocity in, in terms of outreach in that we've seen uh, you know, the US reset, we've seen President uh, Macron. Uh, trying to reach out to Russia. We've seen the UK doing it some years ago. And of course, we, we saw this, uh, th this perhaps unfortunate visit by the, the high representative. So, I mean, it, from Russian side, we did see the Medvedev initiative. That was over a, de a decade ago now. I think it would be very useful to get a sense of actually where does Russia see what are the issues that Russia would be willing to put forward on the table for sort of a... Uh, a transatlantic response now, because with, with deterrence now the focus, there is also, an, I think, a need to, to match that with dialogue uh, to, in order to ensure that we do manage these tensions and lessen them and find a way out. Uh, there may be some symbolic things, uh, primarily symbolic, I guess, that, that the transatlantic community can do on the arms control side. And I, I suppose we're looking to the US here about its position on open skies. Uh, will it come back in uh, and will it revitalize that? But much of the arms control regime for Europe, I think is, is not, it's really lost its sort of traction around contemporary threats and capabilities. So we also need to modernize that. I mean, the, uh, so where, where do we go with that? And, and what would be the Russia perspective on it? Back to you, Marina. 
very much, and, and Professor Kortunov. Well, uh, first of all, on the uh, UK nuclear posture, uh, I think that uh, the United Kingdom uh, has a very special uh, position uh, on many nuclear issues. Uh, on, on the one hand, uh, it's uh, almost like a model nuclear power in terms of uh, its transparency and its openness. Uh, uh, it is clearly superior not uh, only to China, uh, but uh, to the French Republic as well. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the recent uh, decision to increase the number of uh, nuclear warheads uh, uh, will definitely raise questions at the uh, forthcoming uh, nuclear review uh, conference. And uh, definitely it will be used uh, by some of uh, uh, non-nuclear uh, uh, powers to make uh, uh, the uh, uh, complaint about the position of nuclear states and their apparent unwillingness to uh, uh, go ahead uh, on uh, nuclear disarmament. So I can uh, foresee certain complications, but in the end of the day, uh, the uh, transparency demonstrated by the United Kingdom uh, might be a model for other uh, nuclear uh, countries. I think that uh, uh, this uh, uh, pattern of behavior uh, should uh, uh, be uh, offered uh, in our consultations with Chinese uh, as something that at some point uh, they might want to move uh, uh, to. Uh, uh, now, uh, in terms of uh, uh, this uh, issue of uh, NATO and uh, the Russian position on NATO, I personally think that the real problem uh, is not even the NATO enlargement, but rather the NATO monopoly over security matters in Europe. Uh, and uh, the challenge that we have to confront and which we failed uh, to confront over the last 30 years was uh, how to uh, get Russia a seat at the European security table without uh, uh, granting Moscow veto power. Uh, of course, uh, if you look at the Russian position, they would like to get a veto power. And uh, there are many uh, discussions in Moscow about uh, uh, what they uh, call a European Security Council with the authority similar to that of the United Nations Security Council. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the NATO Russia Council uh, turned out uh, to be insufficient uh, mechanism uh, to give Russia a say uh, on major European security matters. And I think that unless we are able to resolve this problem, it would be uh, very difficult uh, for us uh, uh, to think uh, about uh, a viable European security architecture or uh, in other words about a viable uh, European security ecosystem. Uh, I don't think that we have easy solutions to this uh, riddle, but uh, this is something that uh, we should definitely address. Thank you very much. And Sergei Utkin, please. Oh, I would just add that uh, uh, this um... Medvedev's moment on uh, be it uh, Russia and the West relationship or Russia US relationship is long gone, obviously. And we will not be able to just strike out those uh, uh, 10 subsequent years and uh, the events that uh, happened through these years. So we'll have to um, deal with this uh, new situation that we have these days rather than uh, look back nostalgically and uh, hope to revive the uh, hopes of the past. But uh, uh, still also in this uh, much more complicated situation, uh, there are ways to deal with issues. Uh, my uh, feeling is that uh, these ways are rather um, sectoral, if you like. You cannot hope to have some all um, European summit or all European treaty or anything grandiose that would just uh, save us all from the troubles that we are having. Uh, we have to concentrate on particular issues and uh, uh, deal with them. Uh, in this sense, uh, also NATO is, uh, the enlarged NATO is part of those realities. Uh, you may not hope to uh, get NATO back like 10, 15 years uh, and uh, uh, start from that point. You have to start from now, from uh, what NATO is today. And uh, uh, in uh, the British uh, 
strategy documents, uh, you uh, do see obviously a strong emphasis on NATO because, um, well, given the Brexit, of course, uh, uh, NATO is even more central for the UK. Uh, and um, this probably creates a motivation uh, to revive NATO, not just as a format of cooperation between member states, but also as an organization that can reach out to countries that uh, um, disagree with the NATO allies. Uh, and, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a strange approach to dialogue when you only have dialogue with uh, those you agree with. You need to have uh, dialogue with the countries that you disagree with, and uh, Russia could be, could be one of them. On the U.S. role, um, I, I think there is still some potential for um, pragmatic talk uh, between uh, uh, the new U.S. administration and Russia. But part of it, part of it uh, has just been lost um, uh, given the uh, harsh U.S. president rhetoric vis-a-vis -vis Russia. I already see some um, um, a willingness in some European capitals to uh, mimic the U.S. approach uh, to uh, also use uh, a more uh, harsh language uh, with regard to the Russian leadership. And, um, Myself, I think that harsh language never helps. Uh, that uh, even if you have uh, very difficult issues to resolve, you need to be able to um, uh, talk to the decision makers in other capitals. If you um, try to um, insult them, this makes this uh, talk uh, more difficult. I uh, hope that everybody is still able to realize that and uh, that we will be able to uh, keep uh, communication between, between Russia and the US also on the highest level, in spite of all the issues, uh, um, and that uh, this would also help uh, uh, international stability, because of course the relationship between the two major nuclear powers goes beyond uh, their bilateral interests and uh, is also important for uh, the world community as a whole. Thank you very much, Sergei, and thank you to the audience. We've got very many interesting questions and unfortunately we cannot address all of them because our discussion is approaching its end and time is not our ally at this moment. Uh, let me invite uh, Professor Chalmers and Andrei Konstrunov just to conclude this discussion by their concluding remarks. Uh, Malcolm, the floor is yours. Andrei, would you like to go first? If you want me, let me just say that I'm grateful to uh, everybody who uh, raised questions. Definitely, we did not uh, deplete uh, the agenda, uh, but I think that our discussion today suggests that uh, there are many issues that uh, deserve our further consideration and active engagement uh, by experts on both sides. Uh, even uh, if we do not uh, create a miracle, uh, we might uh, help uh, with understanding each other positions uh, and uh, hopefully we can make uh, uh, our maybe very small but still valuable contribution to the relationship between our two nations. So uh, thank you once again and I'm looking forward uh, uh, for more discussions uh, uh, of this type. Thank you. And can I just add to that, uh, Marina, if I may, thank you to you for uh, your excellent sharing uh, of, of this session. It was quite a short session. We had lots of really interesting questions and I'd love to have had an opportunity to, to respond to more of them, uh, not least those which were in Russian, which I was not able to understand. Uh, so it would be interesting to hear more about that. And I agree entirely with, with Sergei that it's actually even more important when our countries differ on, on so many fundamental issues that we talk to each other in, in a respectful fashion, in a way which makes dialogue more productive, more possible and more productive. Because we, at the end of the day, we should not forget this is not an academic discussion. It's not a discussion around a seminar table uh, trying to see who is most clever. We are dealing with issues uh, which are of existential concern to both uh, our countries. And one thing we do know is that uh, both our countries will still exist <laughs> in 10 or 20 years time. We will still have to live in the same continent and the same world as each other. 
and most probably we'll still have governments, as Andre said, even if not, even if the peoples uh, on a day to day basis can get on very well with each other, uh, the governments are still likely to be in a position where we have quite fundamentally different views uh, of international relations and also of domestic politics, uh, because one of the things we haven't talked about perhaps enough is that some of the differences in international stances are related to very different views about the relationship between the state and its people. Uh, and we shouldn't be afraid of talking about that because that is one of the root causes of the, the, the problem we have. So we've touched the surface. I think more than touched the surface, we've scratched some old itchies and we've uh, identified some, <laughs> the new ones to scratch perhaps for, for further, further discussions. Uh, so thank you all very much indeed. And it's great to see our Russian friends in particular once more. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Malcolm. And let me think, thank all the contributors to this discussion and panelists for their realistic assessment of UK-Russia relations for a substantive account of the challenges that the European security system faces at present. And uh, one of the takeaways of our previous discussion on the subject was the need to explore how to deal with this new normal situation, with this damage control situation. Even so, the recipes may vary. This was, I believe, another intellectual contribution to this debate. And let me thank the audience for raising your questions. I'm very happy to see that part of our Young Researchers Network participated in and uh, raised their questions. And, uh, and uh, this is an indication of the multiplicity of issues on the bilateral agenda uh, between Russia and the West and issues that are of serious concern that are likely to define the future of the security order on the continent. And these are the fundamental dilemmas at the heart of European security. And we encourage our virtual audience uh, to check the conference report from our last European security workshop and to stay tuned for the future discussions. Have a nice day and see you at our further events. Bye.